we're going to start this morning with some introduction to scattering, and then Kurt's going to follow this with um, the heavy-duty scattering. But I thought um, we'll, d we'll talk about scattering sort of at this as an introduction. And so I use this same background slide um, because as you see the light rays coming through the water and you're standing back, of course, the reason why you see the light rays is because they're being scattered into your eye. So you did, I think, some examples of this in the lab one, right, where you looked at, at beams of light going through water. So same thing happens in the ocean. So back the first day, I presented this example for how you measure um, absorption and attenuation. And you can do the same thing for scattering. And so again, if you have this infinitesimally thin layer, and if you ignored absorption, but you saw the redirection of light due to scattering by particles in that layer, you can measure the scatterance, which would be the fraction of the power that's scattered out of the beam divided by the incidence, and all the equations that we followed through for absorption and, and attenuation, and you could define the scattering coefficient and derive scattering as being re inversely related to the path length and the natural log of the transmitted versus incident irradiance, which is exactly the same equation as the others. But in order for this to be true, what do, what do we have to say about this medium? In order for the transmitted over the incident power to be related purely to scattering? there has to be no absorption. You can't have any contribution to absorption in this transmitted power, right? And so that will inform how people design scattering meters. And Kurt's gonna talk a little bit about scattering meters um, in his lecture, but uh, we already know how the AC9 derives scattering Right? It doesn't measure scattering, but it derives it by the difference by subtracting that absorption from the attenuation. So, so if we think just briefly about the geometry of scattering, so here you have incident irradiance, and this is the direction of propagation and any sort of redirection of light at some angle theta, that would be the scattering angle. And if you think about it in three dimensions, and Kurt showed a diagram very similar to this, if you have azimuthal symmetry, symmetry the scattering at that angle theta would be uniform about the azimuth. And so we often assume that azimuthal symmetry it makes, the, um, it makes our diagrams easier to look at and it makes the math easier to look at. So <clears throat> that angular dependence uh, of scattering we describe by the volume scattering function, which I think we've briefly talked about. And that's designated beta as a function of that scattering angle and the azimuth angle. And it's the power of per unit steradian per solid angle, right, that solid angle here, coming from a volume of water that's illuminated by irradiance. And so you can think about that as this fractional power per solid angle per volume and due to the in this incident irradiance. So I'm going to just move this volume out here and allow the incident irradiance on that volume, which I've made a cube. And so if we look at that surface area that the irradiance is incident on, you can look at the power per surface area. And so now you have, say, moles of photons per meter squared per second in terms of the irradiance. And that volume has, or that cube has some height, right? And so the volume of that cube is really the fractional area and the fractional height. That would be the, the fractional volume. And so then you can say that beta, which is this power divided by the volume, you can substitute in this term for the volume, right? And you can substitute for the irradiance this term here. And then you can do some canceling, right? 
So we can certainly cancel this term out, right? And then we lo we're looking at the fractional power over the power. And so if you simplify this, you get this term. So now the question is, um, sorry, so, and, and you recognize this is the, the d power over power, so that's going to give you that natural log term that we had talked about before. We know that this is the solid angle, which is, does anyone remember what d omega is in the integral when Kurt derived d omega for solid angle? Sin, yeah, sine theta d theta d phi, yep. Okay, so when we look at the response, like a typical curve for the volume scattering function, where scattering at a small angle is forward scattering, right? So this would be in small angles here, and scattering at large angles would be back scattering. That would be out on this end of the curve. We tend to see curves that look somewhat like this. And notice that this is a log plot. And so if this is a log plot, what can you tell me about the angular distribution of scattering in a general sense? It's mostly forward scatter by a lot, right? And so I've blown this up. This is actually linear here. And you see that it's really within the first couple of degrees that you get this huge amount of forward scatter and that the scattering tends to decrease with angle. And sometimes, you know, you'll see volume scattering functions here. And Kurt's going to talk a lot about the shape of the volume scattering function. Um, but just so that you understand when you're looking at that, you can think of that as a plot of scattering as a function of angle moving this way. Okay. And think about how you might measure that with a sensor. How would you design a sensor to measure the volume scattering function? Okay, so if you integrate this whole curve over the solid angle, of course, that's the scattering coefficient, right? Because you're summing up the loss of light out of that beam for all angles and all azimuth angles. And so that's the scattering coefficient. And as we already said, that's the sine theta d theta d phi. So there's your equation. You're going to integrate d phi over 2 pi, and you're going to integrate theta from 0 to pi. And that will give you the integration for all, um, all angles, solid angles. So, oh, just to, to show you that this would be a small angle, that's going to show up here. If you had scattering at a larger angle, that would be the volume scattering function here. And then, of course, in the backward direction, it would be that point there. Okay. So, quick, yeah. So, on the last plot, um, in an actual instrument, you're not measuring just at a single point. You're measuring, like, you know, the light comes in from here, and then you're measuring a small uh, volume. Angle, right? Mm-hmm. So you're not getting the whole four pi. No. Yes, exactly. All right, I want to make sure that everybody has that point. And I think we'll probably end up talking about it at other points. You you're talking tomorrow. tomorrow. But the point is, if you have incident light and you have your volume, your interrogation volume of your sample, and you have your detector here, and that's the solid angle of your detector, that's the unscattered, that's some forward scatter, that's more forward scatter. And then it's really until you get to this angle that you're calling this scattered light. This, although it is actually scattered, this sensor is calling unscattered. So that makes a difference compared to, say, a sensor where you have a very tiny detector and then that's the unscattered light, and even small scattered light is missed. And so the scattering coefficient that you would measure are, is going to depend strongly on the solid angle of your detector. And so it makes a big difference for, say, your attenuation meter as well. If your attenuation meter has 
um, a big or small angle. And I think Emmanuel and I did some m um, modeling of that for various transmissometers that were on the market. And it's the, the derived attenuation coefficient, or you know, if you have no absorption, scattering coefficient varied tremendously because of what part of this curve are you excluding. So the list is like 0.1 degree, I think it's 0 0.02. 0.02 degrees for the list. Um, for it, yeah, it's one of the smallest um, angles. Um, and some, uh, I think early absorption meters were maybe 0.7. Uh, a C star is one and a half or 1.2 degrees, which is, which is this, right? So it's excluding, all of this is counted as unscattered light. So, how do you compare? How do you do closure? Well, either you have to model what each sensor is missing, um, which is the right approach, but any time you report your beam attenuation or your scattering, you should report what your acceptance angle on your sensor is, just so that people can compare. So, no, very good question. Is that clear, everyone? Okay, so, if there's azimuthal symmetry, you can just um, do this integration and find that, again, um, you can take the, the d phi out and put a 2 pi there and integrate from 0 to pi. That's the whole scattering coefficient. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, because of the thing. If you integrate just this part, that's the forward scattering. And if you integrate the back the angles greater than 90 degrees, that's the backward scattering. So, um, so we have B forward and B back, and it just has to do with the integration. And so just thinking about this, which is larger, forward scattering, right? Forward scattering is tremendously greater than back scattering. Um, we often look at the ratio of back scattering to total scattering, and it's on order of you know, a few percent. And so Kurt's gonna talk a lot about looking at the ratio of backscattering to total scattering and with regards to hydrolyte. Is it 1%, is it 3%? And, and he'll talk about you know, what the implications are. But you can think about that as light going down in the ocean and getting backscattered out the surface. And so it gives you a sense of how much light is being backscattered. So that backscattering ratio is very important because it, it will basically tell you how much light satellites are able to detect compared to how much light is incident on the ocean. Okay. okay. Um, so you'll also see a term called the phase function, which is the volume scattering function divided by scattering, which is the integration under the curve. And it's just a way of normalizing it so you can look at variations in the angular distribution of the scattering function. So I think um, Kurt will also tell you more about that, just in case you see that term. Okay. And just a reminder that all of these terms are, of course, spectral. So you have one of these for each wavelength. Okay, so let's think about the parameters, the particle parameters that are going to influence scattering. And certainly the most important one is concentration. You've got more stuff in the water, you'll have more scattering. So that's your order one source of variability. It turns out that the size of the particle is really important. But what's actually important is the size of the particle relative to the wavelength of light that you're investigating. So you always have to have this caveat as the di particle diameter to, to, to wa light of wavelength of light. <clears throat> the other thing is the refractive index relative to the surrounding medium. And Kurt alluded to this in his, first in his first lecture, talking about how the speed of light changes and the wavelength of light changes as you go from one medium to another. And that will influence scattering. Absorption by particles will also influence the scattering. We'll talk about that. And we'll say a little bit about particle shape. So, um, so those are some things to think to keep track of. And of course, turning this around, if scattering varies with all of these things, it means that you can derive all of these things from scattering. So then there's your opportunity. All right, so we're back to our electromagnetic radiation. And you've already seen this. 
So what happens when that electromagnetic radiation starts to interact with particles? And we're going to look at two extremes, um, and there's a gradation of, of it in for intermediate particles. But you can imagine that you've got particles that are very small. Their diameter is small relative to the wavelength of light. And you can have particles that are large relative to the wavelength of light. And the, the process of scattering is described differently for those two types of particles. So the first one is what we call Rayleigh scatterers. And so if you have these very, very tiny particles and you have this oscillating electromagnetic wave pass through these particles, that sets up a dipole oscillation in the particle right? as this wave is going through. And what happens is then the particle will um, itself, it induces this electromagnetic radiation coming from the particle. And that's called the scattered radiation. So again, here's your particle. Here's the incident light. And then these lines here describe the electromagnetic radiation that's coming away from that particle, the scattering. And so you can see that there's a lot of scattering in the forward direction. There's a lot of scattering in the backward direction. There's some scattering at 90 degrees. It's not completely um, uniform with angle. But that's the behavior, that's the volume scattering function for these small particles that are basically an oscillating dipole radiating energy out in these directions. As you start to get, particles start to increase in size relative to the wavelength, you begin to see more of this forward scattered light, right? So here's another diagram that shows us, this is actually from a, um, I think this is from John Kirk's book. And so this would be the direction of incident radiation. This would be, um, I'm sorry, yes, so this is the direction of incident radiation. So this is scattering in the forward direction, scattering in the backward direction, and you can see that there's some reduction at 90 degrees. This line represents the scattering by red light. This represents the scattering of green light. And the shape of the, the angular distribution of that is the same, and it looks something like this. So here's your volume scattering function for a Rayleigh particle, equal in the forward and backward directions. So think about that for small particles. And the fact that it's different for different wavelengths, oops, hold that thought. We're going to talk about wavelength in a second. Um, but you can imagine here, if this was the volume scattering function for green, here, the red one would be lower, right? So you would have less scattering in the red wavelengths. As your particles get to be larger, then you can think about this, this oscillation of the electromagnetic field through this particle, but the particle, um, the materials within the particle are, are having the similar effects as that electromagnetic radiation goes through it, but they're within, there's a uniformity of all of those small dipoles. And so you can divide up what's happening to those rays into a variety of different processes. You can have light passing by the particle, which is unaffected. You can have light passing by the particle that gets bent, but it doesn't actually touch the particle. You can have light reflecting off the particle. You can have light being transmitted through the particle and being refracted, and then refraction when it comes out. And so you can basically do ray tracing um, of each of these beams of incident radiation. And so here I've sort of color coded them. And if you look at, for a single large particle, what the volume scattering um, pattern would look like, you see these very large forward scattering now. And this has to do with the diffraction. It's this beam here, as well as some refraction through and much less scattering in the backward direction. These lobes are caused by um, uh, uh, convergent and, not convergent, um, constructive and destructive interference of light going through the particle. And I'll show you a picture of that in a second. 
So we can think about um, what happens when light is either reflected or transmitted across this interface between the medium and the particle. And of course, the incident has to equal the transmitted plus the reflective to conserve energy. And it turns out that the amount that's transmitted versus the amount that's reflected is a function of the index of refraction and a function of the angle at which that light comes in. Snell's law tells us how light that's coming off of a particle, coming into a particle, will get refracted. And so if you think about a large particle and light coming in at some angle relative to the vertical, how that light gets bent as it goes into a particle of a different medium is determined by the index of refraction. And I use this diagram, I love this diagram, it came out of some textbook, some introductory oceanography textbook. But I think it's very illustrative to describe what happens with refraction. So you guys have to go with me on this. This is a band. These are marchers. They can have whatever instrument you want, right? So this is the back line, this is the front line. They're all marching in time. Think of each line of marchers as the crest of a wave. So you're watching wave crests, peaks, trough, peak, trough. So these are the peaks of a wave as they propagate along this road, okay? So if you're a very good marcher, you can maintain the distance between the crests and replicate an electromagnetic wave. So this band is marching along this road, keeping time, when all of a sudden the road ends. And at the end of that is sand. And what happens when you walk along a road and then you get to some sand? You slow down, right? So as this happens, that first line of marchers slows down, but the second line of marchers, so if this group is getting ready to step off, they're gonna slow down. So this group is still on the, the pavement. They're gonna continue to walk fast. So they will catch up. But once they get off into the sand, now the distance between them stays the same because they're all marching slow and they're marching at the same rate, okay? So what happened to the wave? What? What can you say if these represent the crest of a wave, what happens when the wave slows down? It shortens the wavelength shortens, okay? And you can imagine that the road started up here, that first group would get on the road and they would like speed right up, right? And then the distance between them and the second line or the second crest would expand again. And they would end up coming out exactly as they started. This is the basis of traffic. So the distance between cars changes as the speed limit changes, but as long as everybody stays the same speeding up and slowing down, nobody crashes. Okay. So, as, so, so you can see that you can shorten the wavelength. The other thing that happens is, and that would be if your light ray was coming in at 90 degrees, you would just see a change in, if this is your wavelength, you would see shortening up of the wave of crest until it came out of the particle and then it would extend again, right? But what happens if the marchers are heading off at an angle? So right here, this is the line of marchers there in a perfectly straight line, but this marcher is going to walk off the road first. And so what's gonna happen? Yeah, you're making the motion. What happens? It's going to slow down, right? And so it's going to get a little bit behind. And then later in time, this second marcher steps off and it's going slower. And so what you see is as each of those marchers step off, they're slowing down. And what's happening to the wave now? It's bending. That's refraction. So this is refraction if the, if the propagation is perpendicular to the surface, the scattering surface. This is refraction if the direction of propagation is not perpendicular to the scattering surface. 
and that scattering surface is a change in index of refraction. Okay, so that's what's happening in your particle. So here, this was like this, and then you change direction, and then of course as you come back out, you'll come back out at the same angle that you came in at, but you're coming out at a different place, a different point in time. Okay. All right. So, what I want you to think about is, let's see, oh, thinking about this as a cell, and I want you to, on a piece of paper, I want you to draw what the wave is going to look like if this particle has an index of refraction that is greater than the index of refraction of the medium. Actually draw the wave. I just sort of mucked around here, but I want you to draw the wave. And then I want you to do it in this case. Okay. So I took this right out of, I copied this right out of Kurt's lecture, so you have the equation. And I, this is not a, di a great diagram because this wavelength is certainly not much smaller than this particle diameter. So we're sort of blowing this up. It's out of scale. But I want you to think about what's going to happen. Okay. Anyone want to sketch it? Hmm? Yeah. I'll give you orange. Who wants to sketch this one? Going from here to here. Anyone else want to sketch this one? Go for it. Do you see why I'm having you do it and why I didn't do it? <laughs> yeah, you good? And, it, and then it comes out the other side. Yeah. Is that what it's showing that it's coming out of So it's coming here and then it comes out a little, yeah. Yeah. It's a higher index of reflection. This is higher index of refraction. Yeah. And so what happens? Wavelength the wavelength shortens, which he's shown here. And then it comes back the other side and, yeah. And so now, what would happen if this same wave was down here and didn't intersect with the particle at all? So, we'll look the same. but I want you to draw it all the way across, okay? All right, so this one, you've got the light coming in and then what happens? Beautiful. So now I want you to start with this exact one, pretend that it doesn't go through the particle, and show where it ends up over here. Excellent. So these two start off as a wave with the crests are lined up. And what happens on this side? They're opposite. They're the opposite. So what happens when you have when you're adding two waves where they become opposite? They disappear, right? That's destructive interference. Okay. So this one's just going under, but it's not touching the yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah, and it's not being interacted by it at all. We need more space. If you were down here, but just so we can see it. So it would just go. Mm-hmm. With the same wavelength. Yeah. It's hard. But do you see what, what we're seeing here? We're seeing shortening of the wavelength, and then it goes back. But it changes 
the relationship between the waves that go through the particle versus the waves that don't go through the particle. And they can come out out of phase, right? The same thing happens here. Oh, exactly out of phase. So I could do the perfect circle for the way that you're changing here. Does everyone, did everyone get something close to this? Does everyone understand why we see this change in wavelength, why we get the refraction, and that the waves that come on this side of the particle are different in relationship to each other than on this side? Excellent, nice job. Gentlemen, thank you. So if we think about the waves that go through the particle, we think about the waves that get diffracted around the particle, and we think about the waves that are not impeded by the particle, the relationship between them is different before they are in the particle versus after they've been in the particle. And that's the, so, so we're going to look at what happens to these waves versus these waves. This is just the volume scattering function for the very large particles. This is that very strong forward scattered light that's primarily due to diffraction, which are the waves that actually bend around the particle and are, are bent in a forward direction um, around the particle. And even though they're not uh, directly touching this particle, they get bent by the interaction of the, um, of the wave propagation. And you can think of this as waves going around a pier. The water doesn't actually touch the pier, but the wave will bend around it. So you get really strong scattering in that forward direction. So if you looked at the diffraction pattern of light um, interacting with, say, a series of circular particles, you would see a ton of light in this forward angle. And then you might have some dark rings. And then you'd see another bright ring of scattered light. This dark ring here is due to this effect. Okay, You might have other light where it comes out and is in phase with the light that went through, and you could get bright rings. So the pattern of these rings has to do with the constructive and destructive interference, which is directly determined by the relationship between the wavelength of light and the size of the particle and the patterns of the, the diffraction relative to the refraction um, and, and the additive properties of that. So this is what the diffraction pattern looks like for circles. And this is what the diffraction pattern looks like for non-spherical particles. So if this is um, zero degrees and this is a few degrees going this way, what can you tell me about diffraction as a function of particle shape? Yeah. It's very dependent on the shape of the particles because here you have, it's, it's not uniform in the azimuth angle, right? So we model a lot of scattering based upon spheres. And thinking about the images that phy of phytoplankton that Mary Jane and Ivana showed, are phytoplankton all spheres? No. So it changes the way we think about diffracted light and, and with respect to shape. The other thing that's important is that light that's diffracted around particles and doesn't go through particles won't tell you a whole lot about what's going on in the particle, right? So the refracted light carries with it a signature of the index of refraction of the particle. The diffracted light and the structures within that cell. The diffracted light, which bends around it, doesn't contain very much information. Okay? But it contains a lot of information about the size of the particles. So the difference between light that goes through the particles versus light that's diffracted around is the basis for the design of the list. How many people have heard of the list? A couple. So the list is an instrument that measures scattering in that far forward direction. Oops, where's my... You'll be using it tomorrow. And so basically what the list does 
you have incident light on your particle volume. There's some lenses, and Kurt will talk about that. But essentially, there's a detector on the other end that's a series of concentric rings. And the detector isn't the whole ring. It's like this portion of this ring, this portion of this ring, this portion. It has 32 rings. So you can measure the light that's scattered at these various angles. Right? And so by being able to measure very precisely the volume scattering function in those far forward scattering angles, it can tell you what, what you're basically measuring is the diffraction pattern. And the diffraction pattern is determined by the, rel the relationship between the size of the particle and the wavelength of light. And if you set the wavelength of light constant, the variations in the scattering in that far forward tell you particle size. Okay. So you'll spend a lot of time with the list, but, but know that it's relatively insensitive to the composition of the particle because most of the light that's going through, um, through the particles, or I'm sorry, going through your volume is scattering around the particles. Some of it of the forward scattered light has gone through the particles, but much less compared to the part that's diffracted around. And so you can use the list for mineral particles or phytoplankton particles, because even though they have very different indices of refraction, the list is relatively insensitive to that. It is primarily driven by the size of the particles. So again, using an opportunity to, to get size distribution. So one of the questions that we might ask ourselves when thinking about these particles is what changes the index of refraction? Um, most particles in the ocean are, you know, bags of water. Most phytoplankton are bags of seawater with some you know, organic carbon. So here's a study by Darius Stramsky, and it was looking at um, some measurements of the index, or they derived the index of refraction for particles as a function of the um, organic carbon concentration for various particles, mostly phytoplankton. And you can see that as the carbon content increases, the index of refraction increases. So the more carbon rich particles are, the more they will refract light. Right? And there was another study done by Mike Twardarski where and, and I, I, I know we'll talk more about this paper later, but where they were looking at changes in the index of refraction and based upon backscattering and size. But each line here is a line of constant index of refraction. So this is low index of refraction relative to water, 2% different from water. This is 20% different from water. And when they plotted data that they measured in situ so that they could predict what the index of refraction was based upon other optical properties and size properties, their phytoplankton dominated waters ended up here. Their resuspended sediment observations ended up here. And so you can see that phytoplankton tend to have a relatively low index of refraction and mineral particles tend to have a relatively high index of refraction. And so if you take an equivalent mass of phytoplankton in the water and you take an equivalent mass of sediment in the water and you say that they're the same size, what is going to scatter light more? Hmm? Minerals. higher refractive index because you'll get a higher refraction of light through the particles. And so mineral particles make the water look more turbid compared to phytoplankton particles, even ignoring absorption, the fact that phytoplankton look more like water. So Emmanuel did the experiment for you. Yes. Oh, instead of doing it on a total mass basis, I think you're still, I think the organic carbon is less refractive than, depending upon what your mineral composition is, but I don't know that to be true. I'm totally making that up. 
Okay. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. When you do it, yeah. So when Emmanuel took that glass rod in, in the setup that you guys did the first day and you put it in water, what did you see? You saw the glass rod. When you put it in mineral oil, what did you see? You didn't see the glass rod. Why? They had the same index of refraction. So when you see things in a system, it's because the light has scattered, which immediately tells you that you have a different index of refraction. And one experiment that I love to have people do in the lab, and you'll get to do when you go back and do the spectrophotometer, if you have used um, fresh water in your cuvette for your bank, blank, and then you pour your salt water sample in there, quickly hold it up to the light and look at it. And what you'll see is the mixing between the fresh water and the salt water, and it's all swirly. Why do you see that? The salt and the fresh are mixing. That process of mixing is turbulent. And there's a different index of refraction of the fresh water versus the salt water. And so what you're seeing is the scattering off of that turbulent structure, which is the, the change in index of refraction is due to fresh versus salt water. So do you want to use that sample in your spectrophotometer? No unless you're interested in some non-quantitative assessment of turbulence. Dump it out and rinse it three times so that by the time you put your sample in there, you don't have that. So the cloaking device, you know, you, you have to match the index of refraction for your cloaking device. Okay. All right. So I want to talk about the effects of absorption on scattering. So um, I think we'll talk about this more particularly, talk about mean modeling, but we talk about the in real part of the index of refraction, which is what we just talked about. It slows down light. The imaginary index of refraction is the attenuation of light. So it's the what, how, how we uh, quantify absorption. And um, so it describes how this electromagnetic radiation is going to be attenuated as it goes through the particle. And it turns out it reduces scattered radiation. So I want to think about a particle, and we'll we've already done what the scattering does. But when we think about what happens to light that's going to get absorbed by this particle, and so we have our light incident, electromagnetic radiation incident on this particle, and this is the magnitude of that oscillation. And as that light goes through, what happens to the intensity of the light as it's absorbed? It decreases. How does it decrease? Linearly, exponentially, hyperbolically. Any ideas? Hmm? Exponentially. So you can think about this in sort of a descriptive way as decreasing exponentially along the path length through the particle. And so when it comes out, same wavelength but different magnitude. Okay. So as that energy is absorbed, that energy, there's less energy for scattering. So let's take it in the extreme. Let's say we had a particle that was 100% absorptive of light. So any light that will go through the particle, typically, and maybe refracted and scattered in there, never makes it out. You'll get diffraction still because it's not going through the particle and you actually have to go through the particle to be absorbed. And what about light that gets refracted and scattered back out in terms of backscattering? Anything there? Nope. There'll be some reflection off the interface, but that's it. So in terms of thinking about particles and the amount of light that's backscattered, <coughs> 
If you have a particle that's non-absorptive versus an identical particle that's absorptive, what could you say about its backscattering? Are they the same? The difference between the two is everything that's not reflected. Exactly. So non-absorbing particles, holding everything else constant, have more backscattering than absorbing particles. So do we have an analog for a particle that might be hyperabsorptive in some wavelength? So sedums dissolved. But think about the think about Mary Jane and Ivana's lecture. Think about phytoplankton, which have are packed with pigments. And then take those phytoplankton and move them so that they're limited by light. And they put on more pigments. And so you can find wavelengths where they can basically be absorbing almost all of the radiation that's incident on them. And so the backscattering will be very low. Now put yourself in an extreme bloom situation where you have huge populations of phytoplankton in the surface waters. They're large cells. They're packed with pigments. What's the water going to look like to your eye? Bright or dark? Hmm? Dark. If they, have, if they are really strong absorbers, the water will look darker, even though there's lots of particles in the water. Because they're absorbing the incident light, and there's less reflec reflection. And so people have looked at algorithms for trying to detect harmful algal blooms, and what you find is that the waters get very dark in the, phyto in the, in the wavelengths in which phytoplankton absorb. If something comes along and eats all of those phytoplankton and there's a lot of detrital particles that aren't pigmented, what's the water going to look like? It'll be much brighter. So you can actually look at how blooms evolve by looking at the brightness of the water. Right? It'll go really dark as you get really high concentrations of strongly absorbing particles and then it can evolve light to be lighter as that pigment is removed. And then you are, again, looking at the scattering properties of the particles. Okay. Okay. So when we think about the constituent properties um, that we need to consider, we need to think about particle size. We need to think about particle composition, the, the real part of the index of refraction, the imaginary part of the index of refraction. We need to think about the particle shape. Um, it's also thinking about scattering off of internal structures, which just is just similar arguments but more complicated. And then when we think about who's scattering, well, we can think about water scattering. We can think about dissolved matter, matter scattering, the inorganics, the organics. We can think about particles in the ocean, organic particles, such as cells and um, multicellular organisms, detrital aggregates. You can think about inorganics, such as um, sediments, pure minerals. These might be mixed, mixed minerals, pure minerals, air bubbles. Um, I put viruses here because um, they're, or they're organic, but they really belong size-wise up here. So, you know, where you place them sort of depends upon um, on your background. So, I got this from Emmanuel, which talks about the size, particle size in meters, and puts sort of the major groups of organisms and, and other particles from the perspective of size and from the uh, amount of water that might be in those particles. So these are more water rich, these are less water rich, which would mean closer to the index of refraction of the medium, farther from the index of refraction of the medium. And then which scattering theory applies. And so this is the very large particles where you can do essentially ray tracing. These are the Rayleigh particles um, where um, we're looking at the dipole oscillation. And so in thinking about scattering in the ocean, you have to consider all of these properties. So if you think about the size of particles versus what we find in the ocean in terms of number, what do we find?
Pardon? It's like a power law, right? We have a lot of really small particles and we have rare large particles. And so um, you make use of the fact that we tend to have this relationship in the ocean uh, when people do modeling and we'll see some of that as we go through these next couple of weeks. So let's start with what's scattering in the ocean. Well, water molecules. Kurt has this beautiful diagram of the volume scattering function of water as a function of angle. So this is forward scattered, side scattered, and back scattered, and it's color coded so that when you visualize this on a sphere as a function of scattering angle, that's your forward scattered angle, and that's your 90 degree scattered angle. This is a really nice diagram, Kurt. Um, so. Sure, what a graphic would say. <laughs> <laughs> it's jet, right? Isn't that the color map jet? <laughs> you could do it with, you know, bright or dark or whatever. But I think it's a nice way of visualizing the volume scattering function. Um, and then he presents it also when he blows up the, the forward scattered light. And you can see that it's essentially, um, essentially equal over the first 10 degrees. And so it's like the log scale of that graph. Um, here is the spectrum of scattering, approximate for, for water. And it's very strongly peaked in the blue and much weaker in the red. It follows a sort of lambda to the minus four-ish type dependence of, of scattering for uh, Rayleigh theory. And the, what's scattering is these clusters. So you get this density in homogeneities. Um, these water molecules are much more densely packed than say these are. And the changes in the density of the packaging, packing of these water molecules is what creates those um, that change in the index of refraction. And so the water clusters we talked a little bit about earlier this week and what allows water to cluster are um, hydrogen bonds that form between them and allow them to pack up or if it's really warm, they move apart. Um, and yeah, and here's the number of water molecules versus temperature as a reminder of that. When you add salt, it also changes. And what you notice is that the polar molecule arranges of water arranges itself around ions and that's the dissolution so here's the negative chloride ion and the po partial positive of the hydrogens tend to cluster around the chloride whereas the negative polar end of water tends to cluster around the sodium and um, I've given you the link here you should go to this link and it actually there's an animation of this process with water dissolution which is really quite nice so what they find is that there's an increase in scattering as you add as you add salt and so if you're increasing the concentration of this is just sodium chloride not total sea salt but this is the increase in scattering measured at 90 degrees and it turns out there's about a 30 percent increase in scattering of seawater compared to pure water and the this is the volume scattering function calculated for seawater and you can compare it to um, to that of pure water and you'll see that it's enhanced but it still is higher in the blue than in the red because even though you've dissolved salt you're still in that Rayleigh um, regime. The next thing to think about are things that are really really tiny are marine viruses. Oh I think I have this out of order with CDOM but um, this is some work from Barney Balch, who will be coming to talk with you. He'll probably talk about coccoliths, but he did a lot of work on marine viruses. This is the size distribution of one group of viruses. This is in um, nanometers. So these are on the order of the wavelength of light, right? 100 nan 150 nanometers. So on the wavelength of, um, these ones are 10 nanometers. So much smaller than the wavelength of light. So they are necessarily Rayleigh scatterers. This is the volume scattering function for water, and here's the volume scattering function for the viruses. So this, there's much higher scattering by viruses, um, and it's also not quite the same shape. So even though they're very small, there's something about them that makes them have a, a, a less Rayleigh-like scattering property, and that's because the, the water molecules are so much smaller than these viruses. And here's a picture of the scary virus. Um, you should probably mention that the result of this paper was that viruses aren't important in scattering. They're not important in scattering. Part of 
Right, right. So, right, they're not important, but they do scatter. I mean, the way that I think about it is that they're in the water, replacing water by their volume, but they're not really any different in terms of what you measure, right? No? Yeah, but the concentration of them isn't sufficient. It's not a missing source of backscattering that we're looking for. Um, then thinking about submicron particles, this is called submicron particles. Here's the distribution of submicron particles in the ocean. The size distribution of them is um, submicron, so it's less than a micron. These are their scattering coefficients um, and their backscattering coefficients. And again, you can compare it to seawater, but it turns out that these colloidal materials are, again, not in sufficient concentrations to be really important, but um, someone had to figure that out, and so they had to make those measurements. Um, this is from, Emmanuel gave me this. He said that he's never seen evidence of scattering of CDOM by the filtered material, except Yeah, so I just wanted you to explain this because this is a great little image. How'd you do that? Um, with an AC9 on my back and, uh, and a computer that I could see the spectrum in real time. Um, so, the, the there, the, the the so he's diving with an AC9 on his back. This is the tube that he's sucking up fluid and measuring basically poor water, CDOM. And so it's just another application of an AC9, which I think is quite nice. So, so these, this will be something that you guys will continue to investigate. We did that yesterday. Uh, phytoplankton have, um, this is for a set of all of these different phytoplankton. Here are their normalized volume scattering functions. This is the scattering spectra. What do you see about the volume scattering functions for all the phytoplankton? Do they look like water? No. Why? It's got symmetrical. It's not symmetrical, which says that because they're large, right? They have much more diffraction, so they have a much more peaked volume scattering function, and there's quite a bit of variability related to their index of refraction and their size. What about the scattering spectra? He's included some viruses and heterotrophic bacteria in here, too, but what do you see about the scattering spectra for phytoplankton? Is it a smoothly varying function? No, why not? Let's see, there's a trough here at 440, and then it goes up, and then there's a trough here at 676, and then it goes up. What's that due to? Absorption, right? So you can see a lot of spectral features in the absorption or due to the absorption. Some, yeah. If you were to switch normalization up to 490 or something like that, yep. does that look pretty smooth? Does that no, because you're always going to have this shape. I mean, it just depends on where you're pulling them together, right? If you pulled them together here, you'd see a lot more variability at 440. The shape of it doesn't change. It's just where those points all come together. But you can't, you're not changing the spectral shape. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, they, I think they normalized it to 400. I like to normalize it to the area under the curve because then you don't tend to have the same tie. It's not all tied to the same thing. But really, the variations in shape, they're not going to change depending on how you normalize them, right? Um, here's some, there's some thought that there, we get a lot of dust um, coming in, terrestrial dust to the ocean, it will settle in the surface and that might contribute to backscattering. So there's been some work looking at the size distribution of different sources of dust and looking at the scattering coefficients. I think these were simulated and you can see that there's this general based upon the size again, whether you have small or relatively large particle sizes, you'll get a, a blue enhanced scattering spectrum versus a spectrally flat scattering spectrum. Um, we can think about air bubbles in the ocean. They certainly in fact affect the AC9 when they're in your AC9, but there's bubbles in the ocean naturally and they're going to have very strong scattering um, 
So this is a study where they measured the bubble size and distribution using acoustics.